This year we've been looking at uh, the book of Nehemiah together under the idea of rise and build coming from the words of chapter 2 where he spoke to the people in their need to revive the stones around the wall. And uh, as we've talked about it, we've looked at the first six chapters which have to do with the rebuilding of the actual stones around the wall, which was an amazing feat in the time it was accomplished. But at the same time, it was just symptomatic. And where we are in the second half is him rebuilding the people because those walls fell because the people had become unfaithful. And as difficult as it might have been, and an amazing task to build those walls in 52 days, to restore the hearts of the people was going to take a lot more. And that's the process that we're in as we enter this particular chapter in Nehemiah chapter 10 this morning. Now, as we kind of put these chapters together, okay, so if it were possible for me, I hear some people can do it, I'm not one of them. If it were possible for me to cover chapters 7 through 12 in one section, I would do that because it's, it's really a continuous flow of thought. I've tried, I don't have the capability, I'm sorry. And so we have to, you know, stop and then back up and stop and back up and remind ourselves of where we've been. And so what is happening now, if we go back to chapter 7, okay, when that break in the book happens. So what happens in chapter 7 is they separate themselves from other people. They begin to separate themselves from the people of the land. They stop the inner, the intermingling. They, they, go through the sense, or they go through the genealogies and see if the people legitimately have a right to serve in Israel. And they make the necessary separations. And then in chapter 8, now this is all over a period of days. Okay? This, is not, this is not major months, six months, a year. This is in a period of days. It's happening pretty sequentially. And then in chapter 8, they bring the book of the law and they have it read. And they realize they have not been keeping the law and they begin to weep. And you remember that Nehemiah tells them, this is not the time to weep because this is actually the Feast of Tabernacles, which is a joyous occasion. And he says, there will be a time to weep, but right now let's celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles. So you've got roughly a week involved in that. And then when you pick up in chapter 9, which is where we looked last month, they come back to that weeping because it's time to talk to God about their sins and they begin to make confession. And you remember how in this process, that uh, in this prayer that is being prayed, it follows the cycle of Israelite history from Egypt into the wilderness, how God delivered them from Egypt. They rebelled in the wilderness, yet God forgave them. God brought them into the promised land in cycle two. They rebelled against him, and God delivered them and forgave them. And then it moves into the third stage of Israelite history, where it is that God gave them kings, he set them up, he set them up in a perfect position to be the world's superpower. They rebelled against him, they had gone into captivity, and now they were confessing their sins, seeking God's forgiveness, because in the previous two cycles of Israelite history, God had been willing to forgive them, or their forefathers, and now they're seeking the same forgiveness. Now, in that same, in that same flow of thought, chapter 9 in verse 38, which we actually did not look at last month, because chapter 9, verse 38, should really be chapter 10 and verse 1. But that's sometimes we have to have chapter headings, we have to have verse breaks, otherwise it would be nearly impossible uh, to navigate. But they're not always placed in the best location. But when we look at chapters 9 and 10, they're all happening on the same occasion. Okay, It's not like chapter 9 happens, they confess their sin, they go home and then something else happens, time elapses, and then they come back in chapter 10. They have to be read continuously. So they make confession, and then they do what we're going to read about in chapter 10, what we're going to call the stone of consecration. And consecration is a word that's pretty synonymous with the words holy or sanctify. It simply means to be set apart for the service of God. Okay, And so <clears throat> what they're doing now is they're going to reaffirm the covenant that God had made with them at Sinai. That's the whole premise of what's taking place in chapter 10. And so to look at this, and what we need to learn from it is the importance of being set apart. Okay, We looked at separation in chapter 7, but there in that separation it was more of a being discerning of other religious groups. Because you had people who were idolaters who were intermingling with the people of God, and God said that can't happen, you, you can't have the intermingling, you can't have me and other gods at the same time. But this is more of just in general intermingling with the world. And as long as the people of God have existed, they have always struggled with the balance and the tension of serving God while not giving themselves to the world. 
or as the old statement goes, to be in the world but not of the world. How does that tension play out? And so, of course, they have missed that point and they're seeking to make that right. And so as we look at this <clears throat> this morning, we're going to look at it under a couple of different headings. We'll begin number one in chapter 9 and verse 38 with the pledge that they make. They're going to make a covenant or cut a covenant with God. So chapter 9, verse 38, he says, Because of all of this, this is the circumstance. Now, because of all of this means to go back to everything said in chapter 9. Because of, and the emphasis in chapter 9 is their sinfulness and God's willingness to forgive. Because of all of this, because of all of our sins, we make or cut a firm covenant in writing. The uh, term many times is not translated into English translations, but it literally means to cut. Because in covenants, you cut them. So uh, in Genesis chapter 15, when um, God and Abraham enter into a covenant, well, actually, God just makes a covenant with Abraham. It's one of these one-sided covenants instead of a two-sided. So he has Abraham, you remember, divide the animals. Cut them in half and put one on one side and one on the other. And that was a common way of making a covenant. You put the animal, you split it, and then the two people entering the covenant, or the single individual in, in Genesis 15, God entering the covenant, passes through the body of that, of that animal. And the indication is that if I fail to live up to the covenant, may what happened to these animals happen to me. And so many times you won't see it, and they don't translate it this way because we don't think of it in these terms, but more accurately translated is the idea of cutting a covenant. Because that's the way it was. And for here, it literally means to cut a firm covenant. And so what they're doing is that they are pledging themselves and going back to the original covenant that had been made at Sinai. And they said, we make a firm covenant in writing. And on the sealed document are the names of our princes and our Levites and our priests. So this is their intention. This kind of summarizes what's going to be said. And then as we move into chapter 10, we look at the particulars and everything else that are going to take place in this covenant. So... Then we turn to the groups of people who signed this particular covenant. And so when we look at these, and we've run into a number of genealogies in Nehemiah, and we've talked about genealogies um, <clears throat> a good bit, I think anyway, because memory serves me, uh, about the importance of genealogies. And sometimes when we hit these genealogies, we just think, ugh, names. But genealogies usually have a structure to them. Okay? And if we can understand the structure, and we can understand what's going on, we can gain something from what is happening. So let's look here, because what we have are several groups of people who are entering into this covenant. Number one, you have the governor. In chapter 10 and verse 1, on the seals of the names, on the seals are the names of Nehemiah, the governor, the son of Hakaliah. And so that's the first individual who signs it. The one who wants to lead the restoration of the people of Israel is the first one to put his name on the paper. If you want to lead change, you first have to lead the change within yourself. And you have to be willing to step out and to push yourself and not ever ask other people to do what you yourself are unwilling to do. If you want people to be more faithful to God, you have to push yourself to be more faithful to God. You don't have the right to stand up and call people to faithfulness while you remain in mediocrity. And Nehemiah signs this very first because he's the one that's been calling for this from the beginning. We have to make things right. And I'm the first one to admit. And listen, just because someone calls for change doesn't mean that that individual is saying that they are perfect. Because Nehemiah admits he hasn't been perfect. He puts his name to the covenant first. And the covenant is going to admit three major blunders that they have, that they have committed. And so the governor signs it first. Then, when we look at the rest of verse 1 through verse 8, these are individuals who are priests. We won't go through and read the names for time's sake, but they are categorized as priests. So now you have 22 priests. Most likely, these individuals that are named, it's actually probably a lot more individuals. That The individual's names stand for the heads of households. And so probably entire families are captured. So when you see 22 names of priests, it's probably a lot more people involved uh, in the process being their families. But here you have, with Nehemiah, you had the secular governor of the land, and now you have the priest, the people in charge of the spiritual welfare of the people. 
it was their job, Malachi chapter 2, Malachi, he, when we get to Nehemiah chapter 13, we'll see that Malachi is parallel to Nehemiah 13. There's a big gap between 12 and 13. And so when you look at chapter 13 and, and, what, ne and what Malachi is preaching, you start to see the overlap and you see the, the message and how it works together. But one of the things that Malachi rebukes the priests for in Malachi chapter 2, he said it was the priest's job to guard knowledge. It was their job to make sure that truth was taught in Israel. Why were there so many prophets that had to be raised up? Because the priests had failed at their job. They weren't doing it. And many times throughout the prophets, we're going through Jeremiah right now in private study. Jeremiah, how many times does he call the priest on the carpet and say, you haven't been doing what you're supposed to be doing? The priests are admitting, I have, we have not taught. We have not taught the people of God the way we're supposed to teach them. Then he turns to the group of individuals who were the helpers of the priest, and those were the Levites. You remember Levites could serve around, and many, they, they had a lot more tasks when it was... Uh, when they were involved with the tabernacle, the transportation, but as the temple came upon the scene, they also had other tasks that they would uh, carry out. And you have 17 families or individuals listed here, again, most likely families involved, not just the individuals who sign it. And so here you have other spiritual leaders stepping up and saying, we're going to change and we're going to be who we need to be. And then when you drop down to verse number 14, I think I may have it listed as 13, but it's supposed to say 14. You have the chiefs of the people, the leaders, the ones who are responsible, kind of like the elders of the particular sections and groups of people that were responsible for their oversight. Those individuals are stepping up, and they are saying they're going to change. So what you have here is something that's quite magnificent. Because what is happening? You see repentance happening at the top. You see the leaders themselves saying, we have not done this right. We haven't led right. We haven't taught right. We haven't, we haven't held people responsible in the correct way. We haven't upheld the law. And as we're going to see, we allowed people to intermarry. We allowed people to break the Sabbath. We allowed people to neglect the temple. We never called their hand on it. We never told them what they should be doing. We never spent time with them. We never loved them. We never pushed them toward God. And we're here to say together as a group that we were wrong before God. For our neglect. How many times have we ever seen that happen? How many times have we ever heard, because what we're going to see is it's not just leaders here in just a second. How many times have we ever heard of whole churches repenting for unfaithfulness to God? Because that's basically what happens here. Because the next group of people in verse 28, the rest of the people the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, all who have knowledge and understanding, verse 29, they join with their brothers. Everybody is saying, we're not who we, who we are supposed to be. We're not who we're supposed to be. We have not done what God has called us to do. It's very important that we keep this in front of our eyes, that we know what it is that God expects of us and what it is that we're actually doing. Because many times it's easy to get sidetracked and focus on the things that really aren't of that much importance to God. But sometimes the reasons why we focus on those lesser issues is because we feel like we're accomplishing something. Well, it may be something small, and it may not necessarily be what Jesus demands that we do, but, you know, at least we're accomplishing something. Well, if it's something we shouldn't be doing to begin with, if it's not primary, then it doesn't matter if it's accomplished or it's not accomplished. It doesn't get us to where we need to be. But it makes us feel better because it makes us feel like we're accomplishing something. And one of the other things we have to realize is this. Other, the other side of that spectrum where we get into trouble is that some people say, well, look, we've got all these different things going on. We must be accomplishing something. We're busy. But here's the thing, and any business leader and expert will tell you this. You can never confuse busyness with accomplishment. You can run on a treadmill all day long, but if your goal 
is to run from Alabama to Mississippi? You were busy, but you were worthless in the process. You were busy, but you didn't accomplish anything. And as one of my favorite leaders says, <clears throat> there's nothing quite so useless or wasteful as accomplishing that which should not have been done in the first place. And so these people, now under the authority of Scripture, having had the law read into them, have reminded themselves in Nehemiah chapter 8, what it is God expects of them. And they've begun to look at themselves and say, what God expects and what we're doing don't line up. And that led them to confession, to confess their wrongs, but in this chapter, it's leading them to say, we're not just going to confess and say, yeah, we did wrong. We actually want to change. We want to bring our lives into line with what God wants us to do. And that leads us then to the particulars of this new covenant. So <clears throat> as we look at them, they first enter into a curse, which is common with covenants, as we'll see in a minute. It says, verse 29, they join their brothers, their nobles, and enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given, um, excuse me, was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God, or the Lord our Lord, that he, uh, his rules and his statutes. Sorry, trying to read through fogged up glasses is a little difficult. <clears throat> um, so they're entering into a curse. So with any covenant, you had blessings and curses. Deuteronomy 28 expounds upon the blessings. God tells them the benefits of keeping the covenant. He tells them the consequences or the curses from not keeping the covenant. That's Deuteronomy 28. It's also found in latter portions of Leviticus as well. So with any covenant, and even if you want to even think about it this way, it's basically a contract. Okay, It's a little bit more personal when it's God and his people. But you could think of it in a contract. And in a contract, it basically says what? When you go sign a note at the bank, we're borrowing this amount of money. This is what we expect of you in return. And if you don't, these are the consequences. We can repossess or we can take your assets that you put up as collateral, all of those different things. That's the idea. Okay? And so when they're saying we're entering into a curse, we're entering into an oath, we are saying to God that we're coming to you. We want to serve you. But if we are unfaithful to you, we understand full well that we deserve a curse and we will receive a curse from you. We will receive punishment. Listen, to enter into oath with God is not something to be taken lightly. I'm not, me personally, I'm not one who's into just baptizing people for the sake of saying we baptized people. Because when somebody makes that decision, they need to understand they're entering into lifelong covenant with God. Sometimes, and the way we pitch the gospel to people, and I hate to use that term, but that's how some people do it. They pitch it. We're like dirty car salesmen. Not all car salesmen are bad, but there are plenty of them that are. We, we talk to you only about specific things, and we don't tell you the downsides. We don't tell you what could go wrong. We don't tell you what has happened. And some people, when they preach the gospel to people, they won't lay out everything in front of them. But Jesus said very clearly that we need to count the cost in Luke chapter 14. So, they're willing to say, we want God, we want the benefits of the covenant, and we understand what happens if we do not keep them. Now, these are three particular areas in which they had failed. They called these out specifically. Number one, they had failed when it came to marriage, or more particularly, uh, intermarriage. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the lands or take their daughters for our sons. God had forbidden intermarriage between the other nations. Deuteronomy 7, 1 through 4, that was very clear. And he was very clear as to why. It wasn't because God did not like them. It's because of their idolatry. They knew that if you had a family that was faithful to God and a, faithful, and a family that was idolatrous and you mixed them, that idolatry has the tendency to win because, not because God is inferior, but because the idol is always created in the image of the human being. It will give him what he wants, and it's appealing in that sense. And so he knew that's where he would go. 
Now, he had made it very clear that's not what's supposed to happen, but that's what they had done. You see it in Ezra, and we're going to run into it again in Nehemiah, uh, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. And so they had gone, and they had intermarried. And so they said, we're going to stop this. We're going to stay faithful. And Malachi, speaking to this same issue in Malachi chapter 2, says that the reason why he wanted Israelite, faithful Israelites to marry faithful Israelites is to preserve a seed of faithful people who could then produce the Messiah into the world. Okay? So marriage, intermarriage is the first area. Number two was the Sabbath. <clears throat> Verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring in the goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day. And we will forego the crops of the seventh year and the, exact, and the exaction of every debt. So you got a couple of things going on here. So first of all, on the Sabbath, obviously, there was no work. Exodus 28 through 11, Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. No servile work. How do you think Americans would do with the Sabbath? We're workers, right? Nobody works like us. That may not be something we ought to be as proud of as we think we are. Because when you look at the teachings of Jesus in the New Testament, you remember he told the parable of the sower, and there were a group of people there who became Christians. But they got so busy, God got choked out of their lives. You know, the thorns come in, the cares and the riches and the, the pleasures of this life come in and they choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. They were to have this one day where they focused solely upon God. They weren't supposed to work. They were supposed to trust Him. Now watch this. It's going to get a lot more complex than that. Because now he's about to say, now they say, oh, and we're also going to observe the seventh year, the sabbatical year. Now what's the sabbatical year? Leviticus 25. On the seventh year, we will not work at all. We will not farm the land. We will let it lie. And he goes on to explain, God does in Leviticus 25, that in the sixth year, he would provide them with three years worth of harvest to sustain them until their next harvest came in years later. Imagine the trust that it takes to do that. Humanly speaking, it makes no sense, but God doesn't call us to operate in the sense of human speaking, especially with those group of people with his promise to them. And, oh, by the way, try this one on for size. At year 49, you would have a sabbatical year, and then at year 50, you'd have what? You'd have a year of Jubilee, so there's two straight years you can't do it. Okay, now take it even a step further, the exaction of every debt. Because in the seventh year, the people that you had lent money to, you canceled the debt. People say, terrible business practices. Here's something we have to understand, and I know it sounds anti-American. But there is more to the bottom line than making money. There is more to life than making money. Namely, a relationship with God. Further than that, taking care of people who cannot take care of themselves. They had violated these laws. They had broken them plain. I mean, broken them in half and shattered it in pieces and scattered it all over the place. As a matter of fact, it's interesting to me at the end of Second Chronicles, which is parallel to the end of Second Kings, that the writer says this. The writer says this. In 2 Chronicles 36, 21, he says, they went into captivity until what? Until the land had enjoyed their Sabbaths. What does he mean? He means that none of them, for all of these years, he was going to let the land, the land grow, uh, lie for 70 years because in all of the years they lived in the land, they did not observe the, sab so the sabbatical year. They didn't observe the sabbatical year. One of the reasons they went into captivity. 
But then you move to the third area, which is the area of the temple. They neglect the area of the temple. And so they say this, beginning in verse 32. And they break it down into several different sections, which we'll, we'll talk about here. He says, we also take on ourselves the obligation to give, a, give yearly a third part of a shekel uh, to the service of the house of God. For the showbread, you remember the bread that was on the table in the, tab- or in the temple, and the grain offerings and the regular burnt offerings, that's Numbers 28, they were to burn their offerings in the morning and in the evening, and the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, the sin offerings, to make atonement for Israel and for all the work of the house of our God. So they were to pay a temple tax to take care of some of the things that took place within the temple. Next, they were also to supply wood because they're having a lot of burnt offerings. So somebody has to bring the wood. Leviticus 6, 12, and 13 says we're supposed to keep it burning all the time. It does not tell us how or who. Well, here it says we the priests, the Levites, and the people have likewise cast lots for the wood offering to bring it into the house of our God according to our father's houses at times appointed year by year to burn on the altar of the law uh, or to burn on the altar of the Lord our God as it is written in the law. And so they're promising to bring in the wood. Then it moves to the first fruits, verse 35. We obligate to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all the fruit of every tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Also to bring to the house of our God the priests who minister to the house of our God, the firstborn of our sons and of our cattle. So when God delivered them from Egyptian bondage in Exodus, he said, Israel is my firstborn. And one of the laws he set up was the firstborn son of every family. Instead of giving the child over to the Lord, you paid a, you paid a transaction fee. You, don't, you gave money to stand in the place of redeeming so that you could keep that child. And so it was a, it was a monetary transaction. But they're saying, we're going to do that and for our cattle. As it is written in the law, the firstborn of our herds and of our flocks. The firstborns, they're all going. This is the way God is creating a revenue stream and taking care of the temple. To bring the first of the dough and of our contributions, the fruit of every tree, the wine, the oil, to our priests and the chambers to the house of our God. You see how much is involved here. You know, sometimes when we talk about, and we're actually going to mention the tithe here in a second, we talk about the 10% giving to God. We have to remember that Israel was not just a spiritual body, but they were also a national body. So they had, so sometimes we think Jews, they gave 10%. Well, it depends on which part you're talking about. They gave a tithe. They also gave first fruits of everything that they had, a certain portion and percentage of everything that they had. But they also paid taxes on top of that. And so they're, they're, they're sending in a lot, a lot of revenue. And they say this, we're going to bring to the Levites the tithes from our ground. That is the tent. The tithe just simply means a tent. For it and for the Levites who collect the tithes in all our town where we labor. That is, the, the tithe went directly to support the priest in their work in the temple. And so it says, and the Levites shall bring up to the tithe, uh, shall bring the tithe of the tithes to the house of our God, to the chambers of the storehouse. For the people of Israel and the sons of Levi shall bring the contribution of grain, wine, and oil to the chambers where the vessels of the sanctuary are, as well as the priests who minister and gatekeepers and the singers. We will not neglect the house of our God. Before it seems as if, who paid the price to have the walls rebuilt and who paid the bill to have the temple rebuilt? Persians did. Now they're saying we're going to take this responsibility on ourselves. But these are three main avenues where they had neglected the law of God. Okay. So, what does all this mean to us? How does what they committed to do have anything to do with what we commit to do? Let's go back to verse 28 for a minute and see a subtle shift in what's being said here as we think about what's going on. He says, The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the peoples of the land. Okay? From the peoples of the land. They consecrated themselves from something. They consecrated themselves from the people of the land. There was a separation that took place. Okay? We're not going to intermingle 
Again, not elitist, not superiority, but it's about intermingling religions. We're not going to intermingle with those people who are involved in the things of the world. That is, we're not going to welcome them into an open relationship. It doesn't mean that you don't have relationship with sinful people. I mean, good grief. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, we'd have to go out of the world if that was the case. You're going to have to have relationships with sinful people. You're going to have to interact with sinful people. How else do you evangelize? But there's a difference between, and as it has rightly been said, even when you look at Jesus and his interaction with sinners, because so many people look at Jesus' interaction he ate with sinners, and people say, well, that's what I'm doing. Be careful. As it has rightly been said, Jesus ate with sinners. He didn't sin with them. And there's a world of difference in those two things. He ate with them, but he did not sin with them. And never did they believe that he condoned their sinful behavior. Never. And there's a difference in those two things. We are separating ourselves from the world. We're not going to walk in their ways. We're going to walk in the ways that God has laid out. But more than that, we're consecrating ourselves to something. Notice, it's not just running away from it, but they're consecrating ourselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God. We're not just leaving it behind, but we're sacrificing that. We're giving that up in order to get something, to, to do something in return, and that is to have God. That's to have God. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, You remember in verses 9 through 11, he says, the unrighteous won't inherit the kingdom of God. And he lists a number of of sins that individuals consider to be big ones. Sexual immorality, idolatry, homosexuality, a number of different things that are listed there. And he says, and such were some of you. But this is why you're not that anymore. You were washed, you were sanctified, and you were justified in the, name of our Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. When we become a Christian, when we are washed, reference to baptism, that means, we'll say, so the references to washing, sanctification, and justification, they're all simultaneous, the same thing. Okay, So when we are washed in the waters of baptism with the blood of Jesus, we are justified, but we're also sanctified. We're set apart then. We belong to God. We are to be used in His service. We're not going to do the things of the world anymore. We're going to do the things of God. That's where we belong. We're being consecrated from the world to God. People say, okay, that's the initial conversion. All right, but when you look in 2 Timothy chapter 2, and Paul is dealing with the problem of false doctrines that have crept into the church, he tells them that in every house there are certain vessels that are for honorable use and some that are for dishonorable use. Okay? For an example, I would hope that there's probably a difference between a bowl that you eat cereal out of and a bowl you put your leftover grease in. Maybe they're the same, but I never want to come eat with you. At least not in your bowls. There has to be a difference, right? There are some that for honorable use and for dishonorable use. And he says here, if a man purges himself or cleanses himself from these things, he will become a vessel fit for honor, fit for the master's use. So when I turn away from the world and turn toward God, I receive one of the highest honors of my life. That God then uses me as a cleansed, sanctified vessel to do his will in the world. And not just anybody can do that. Not just anybody can be used by God for His purposes and for His service. But we can when we become sanctified. That's the whole point. When we become consecrated, when we become set apart, that's who we become. Now the third thing we have to keep in mind is that this is a continual process. So... The three things that were mentioned here primarily that they said we made big mistakes on. They mentioned intermarriage, failure to keep the Sabbaths and and the things involved with that, and then the neglect of the temple. 
when you come to chapter 13, Nehemiah comes back after having been away. And the three things, the key phrase in Nehemiah 13 is, then contended I. He goes to war with the people again. He contends, he stands against them and he rebukes them for their sinfulness. And what are the three sins that they have committed? They have begun to intermarry again. They have begun to neglect the Sabbath again. And they have begun to neglect the temple so much so that they let a Gentile live in the temple. And so the point is that we have to constantly be dedicated to the process of sanctification. Yes, it happens initially when we become Christians. There is the sense of sanctification positionally. We're set, apart, we're set apart for God's service. But we also go through this process of life called sanctification where we're becoming more and more like Jesus. And we're keeping ourselves cleansed from the world. Therefore, God can use us in His service. And as we said a moment ago, I believe that there's no higher honor that we possess than to be used by God for His purposes. No matter what you and I do, to be used by God means to touch eternity. And there's no other place you're ever going to find the ability to touch eternity. Because a lot of people desire to make a difference in this world, and that is a good thing. God is concerned with making a difference in this world. But God is ultimately concerned with making eternal differences. And when you are set aside through obedience to the gospel, when you are set aside to serve Him, you are then set aside to serve and to touch eternity through the impact that, in that you have on other people for their good and for God's glory. What else could there be to do with our lives? People say, but I can't be a full-time employee of the church. That's not the point. It's not about being a full-time employee of the church. That's not what we mean by being set apart to the service of God. There are things, listen, the people who have the most impact for Christ, especially in today's society, it's not going to be the guy full-time employed by the church. Why? Because the second they find out what I do, what happens? Oh, we're clamming up because this, this guy's not normal. Now you can't say, now he's a preacher now, you can't say that kind of stuff around him. You know, we can't talk to him about that kind of stuff. You're right, because I was born in a suit and I'm just perfect. What it, like it or not, it's the reality. You have the better chance. You have the better chance of impacting people. Use you where God, you, let God use you where he has placed you. In your families, in your professions, in your friendships, use them. He has set you aside for himself. Render yourself willing to serve him and allow him to use you. And stand back and watch what he can do. Because you'll be surprised by it. So the question for us this morning is, are we willing to let go of the world? Because we can't keep a foot in the world and a foot in service to God and expect to change the world. Half-hearted commitment. People who are half-heartedly committed to things don't ever make a good case to give up one lifestyle to go to the other. But people who are sold out to one side or the other, they can make a strong, compelling case. And so if this morning somebody is willing to say, I'm tired of doing the things of the world. I want to be used by God for good. Well, it's very simple there. With a penitent faith confessing Jesus, as 1 Corinthians 6 talks about, we become washed in the water and in his blood and we're justified and we're sanctified and we're set apart for his service. Or maybe as New Testament Christians, we're having trouble, and every one of us will as we go through this process of sanctification, of keeping ourselves pure. Maybe we need to come back to him and say, I simply want to serve God and him alone. That's it. If we can help you do that this morning, that's what we want to do as we stand and sing this song.